Abortion in the early stages of pregnancy should be okay because the preborn child is not yet viable. If one embryo can divide into two identical twins, doesn't that mean that life must begin at some point after conception? And what if the mother is addicted to drugs or alcohol that would permanently affect the preborn child? Isn't it more merciful to have that abortion before the child is aware of their existence? These are three of the justifications for abortion that we are going to be tackling today to share with you how you can effectively and winsomely dialogue with someone on the streets, at work, at school, on these arguments. Stay tuned. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Pro-Life Guys podcast. I'm excited for this one. Uh, this is Here's What We'd Say to That Part 6, um, Segment 6 from this series. And I like this one. I like this segment because... This is where we really get to dive into some of the abortion justifications. And this is where I really get to hear some of Cam's wisdom and to, to hear his experience come forth uh, to teach me as well. So I'm really excited about this, Cam. Hello, sir. <laughs> Peter, it is good to be back, my friend. Um, and for those of you tuning in, if this is your first time listening to a Here's What We'd Say to This, um, then cool, welcome. Check out the other five episodes that we've done before this. If you are not new and you've listened to more of them, I hope that you continue to enjoy them. And just off the top of your show, if there are topics that you want us to address, if there are items that you say, you know what, you guys have done six of these, and how have you not addressed this concern that I keep hearing from my friend or from my coworker or whatever, please do hit us up on social media. Um, you can find us on all of the major platforms, and I'm sure some of the minor ones as well, or you can go to our website, prolifeguys.com. Um, these are largely the ones, Peter, that you and I are hearing when we're doing activism or that our colleagues or volunteers across the country are, are hearing. Um, but if you are hearing something different at your sphere of influence, please do hit us up because this is all about giving you the tools that you need. And if these are not the tools that you need, um, we want to make sure that we're, <laughs> we're giving you the tools you need. That's right. Yeah. And I just want to say one thing before we dive into the first argument here. And that is that when I think about preparing these episodes, when I think about apologetics, when I'm on the streets and, and hear something, it's like, oh, man, I don't know how to respond to that or, or hear something or, or read something on the Internet. One of the main resources that I turn to is this book. Now, this book is written by our colleague, um, Justina Van Manen. And it is called Stuck, A Complete Guide to Answering Tough Questions About Abortion. It's like a textbook. Um, you can flip through it. You can look at the, the many different arguments. If you're just, you know, maybe lying in bed and you think about this, this argument and you're not sure what uh, you would respond to that argument with, um, do tune in. Uh, do tune in. You can tune into the Pro-Life Guys as well. But you can also pick up Stuck, A Complete Guide to Answering Tough Questions About Abortion. It's one of the resources that I reference quite a bit when I'm preparing show notes for episodes like this. So you can check that out at prolifeguys.com slash shop. Um, and I'm sure at some point shortly, we're going to have a Christmas sale. I know we are because I did talk to the person in charge of this. I just don't know what the number is yet. So I can't, I can't confirm the percentage uh, off and, <laughs> and anything like that. But um, go check it out, prolifeguys.com slash shop. Equip yourself with good pro-life apologetics and support the pro-life ministry here, the Pro-Life Guys podcast and the organization we work for, CCBR, to keep bringing people onto the streets, to keep reaching more and more people with the truth about abortion. Cam, let's take it away with argument number one. And that is something that we hear a lot. Um, the times that I've spent on the streets, this is a, a pretty common argument. And it is this. Abortion is okay in the early stages because the preborn child is not yet viable. Viable meaning um, they're not yet able to live outside of the womb, independent from the uh, direct connection to their mother. And, and this is what they're getting at. Embryos and fetuses, um, they are they might be alive, um, but they're certainly not um, morally, they, they certainly shouldn't have the rights that we have because they don't have that sort of autonomous nature about them yet. They're completely dependent upon their mother's body for survival. And so they can't be an entirely independent human being and because they're not, um, they, they really shouldn't receive human rights. Now, I don't know if you want to add to that briefly, um, or if we could dive right into the challenges that an argument like this faces. Do you hear this in, in different variations as well, Cam, or is this sort of, sort of the main thing for you? 
I definitely hear this in a lot of different iterations, whether people are challenging the biology of whether they can actually be characterized as a unique biological organism until they're independent or whether it's just a philosophical kind of thing of like, sure, technically speaking, they're a living member of the human species, but they're not a, as you mentioned, a morally relevant or a meaningful member of the human family until they exist independently of their mother. Definitely hear it on either end. And as we dive into here, Peter, that's either bad biology or bad philosophy or both. Um, certainly not neither. Um, but I, I think it's good to dump, jump into the challenges to the argument that we can bear in mind as we're trying to understand where the person is coming from. We talk often about how we don't want to make assumptions, Peter, as to people's arguments. Sometimes we want to gather a little bit more information and find out where they're coming from. Are they kind of in the first camp where they're saying that a human fetus or a human embryo doesn't get human rights or isn't a human until they can absolutely survive outside of the womb completely independently? Or are they saying, you know what, the, the human embryo, human fetus, so long as they're outside of the mother's womb, whether they're hooked up to any number of medical um, instruments and and um, different, I, I'm blanking on, on a synonym for instrument, but I, I suppose instrument will be sufficient, um, different machines in a medical room that can can go along with it. That I think is an important distinction because... The the second, the latter, that second point of being dependent on medical um, technology is a rapidly changing factor, right? That that medical technology is constantly improving by by God's grace and through the ingenuity of of scientists and and um, medical professionals and viability, as was characterized by Roe v. Wade, for example, in 1973, fits into this latter. Um, definition that so long as they're not living inside of the mother's womb, it doesn't matter how dependent on outside forces they are. This is changing week after week after week. This is changing um, from what decades ago was basically full term babies. If you weren't full term, then your your odds of survival were really, really low. To now there are children who are born at 22, 21 weeks um, gestation, less than a pound um, at at um, delivery sort of thing. It, it's incredible. And so I think it's an important to in some ways clarify what do they mean by that? Because if they mean the, the latter, then you can argue, okay, well, if this child would get human rights, if they're outside of the womb, if, if we're talking about a 26 week old human fetus, if we're talking about a 30, 35 week old human fetus, whatever it is, this child, if they were simply in a different physical location, if they were outside of the mother's womb, you would be okay with them being included in the human family. What is it about our physical location that prevents the exact same child at the literally the exact same age, either one spot, they're not a human and not a human that gets human rights or the other that they are, rather than the first one. The first one is a lot less sensical when it comes to you're not a human until you're entirely independent. We're going to dive into that, Peter, a little bit further. But does that kind of make sense what I mean with regards to the, the two different ways that we can characterize viability? Yeah, yeah, that's right. And that's one of the key challenges. And so just to just to reiterate, the one position is at any point in pregnancy, because the preborn child is still connected to the mother living inside the mother, that means they are not vi viable. That's how some people look at it. The other side is, um, you know, sort of vi there's a viability cutoff mark. Right now, it could be about 21, 22 weeks based on our medical technology. But like you said, that changes all the time. 100 years ago, uh, by this definition, we were way less viable, um, you know, throughout pregnancy, or we were, we were viable way later on in pregnancy. A hundred years from now, we're going to be most likely viable way sooner, um, hopefully, as medical technology progresses. And so, yeah, that's that's um, that's a key point. And we're going to touch just briefly in a moment on how we would respond to that, Cam. How you can use our tools of common ground analogy and question when we're in these conversations. I just want to say another challenge with this as well has to do with natural environment because the argument goes that um, they're not viable in, um, and this I have never heard this said, but it's sort of implied in their natural environment. And now we can all agree that, um, you know, you and I are viable in our natural environment, just where we are right now on this earth with, you know, breathing air, all of that. Um, you and I can't survive on Mars. We can't survive underwater for any length of time. 
without special space or diving technology at our disposal and at our continual use. And so when we're talking about preborn children, we're often comparing sort of humans in outer space to preborn children in their mother's womb. But the, the problem with that is that a preborn child is viable in the specific location that they are in. Um, they're viable in the, in the location that they are designed to be in at the stage of life that they are in. Um, we can't beg the question and say that every single human being is, vi is only viable when they're in one particular environment, when we know that humans throughout different stages of life are in different environments. Uh, you know, this, the key one here being the mother's womb. And so, um, then, then we get to more the independence question, the dependence question, whether the dependent or independent on their mother. But when it comes to viability, we have to recognize that a preborn child at 10 weeks is viable. No, they're not viable outside of the environment that they were created for at this stage of life. But yes, they are viable for the very environment that they are in that was designed for them uh, at 10 weeks. And then one more thing, Cam, before we dive into um, responding, this viability argument, as our colleague Justina Van Manen points out in the book, Stuck, A Complete Guide to Answering Tough Questions About Abortion, which you can find on prolifeguys.com slash shop. Um, it, it is uh, in order to ask the question, can they survive? We must first acknowledge that they are living, she writes. And so the question of viability presumes that life has already begun and doesn't ask uh, and asks whether or not that life might end. So we would not speak of viability unless we are speaking of a being that is already alive, that is already growing and developing and most certainly living. As we've talked about in previous episodes, uh, episode two, which was a long time ago, sir, um, about the biology of preborn children. We might have to, we might have to do an episode on that again, maybe sometime. Um, I don't dare listen to that one because I think we were way worse podcasters <laughs> back in those days. <laughs> <laughs> when we had never sat down behind a microphone before. But how would we respond to this? Um, when we hear this in the streets, when we know that we have these tools, common ground, analogy, question, and when we're thinking about what these folks are getting at, maybe it's viability, maybe it's dependence or independence, how can we respond to this argument? Yeah, so I think there's two ways, Peter, that we can respond. One is kind of the long form format of common ground analogy question that we'll dive into. Um, and the other is a more streamlined kind of plan of argument that um, challenges the human plus X kind of idea. And I'm going to expand on both of those ideas in just a moment here. The reason I want to talk about both of them is because... Um, up until very recently, we only had the former. We didn't really talk about age-based discrimination until quite recently. Um, and so any book that you would have by Scott Klusendorf or Greg Kokel or Randy Alcorn or Trent Horn or any of these pro-life apologists are going to go through this model as well. And so let's characterize it here. The first step is common ground, I, acknowledging that yes, I agree with you, that the preborn child, the human embryo, human zygote, human fetus, um, whatever stage we're talking about, is entirely dependent on the mother and would not survive outside of the mother's womb. I want to find common ground. We don't want to debate whether or not that is a biological fact or not, because it is a biological fact that that child could not survive outside of the womb. Second step in this longer form argument is the analogy component, where we trot out the toddler or introduce the infant or whatever alliteration you want to use. And we say something to the effect of imagine that a born child is because of the way that their body has developed. Maybe they're born prematurely, maybe some other factor, um, a genetic condition or a disease that they've um, gotten sick with. They become dependent, completely dependent on um, medical technology. They are hooked up to any number of machines within a, a hospital room. Would it be okay? to kill that child or does that child cease to have human rights because of their dependence on external forces? And if we say no, no, that child retains their human rights regardless of their dependence on external forces around them. If not born children, why the same preborn, same children a few months or a few years earlier? That pivot question that brings us back to the human rights argument. Um, that's kind of the long form. You got to find an analogy where there's a similar degree of dependency um, outside of the womb and make the analogy that way. 
definitely works. I've used this analogy for years and years while working for CCBR and even before then. But the more streamlined root, Peter, that I'll, I'll mention is what we would call the age-based discrimination argument of the human plus X argument, where you can still find the common ground. Yes, you and I can agree that this child is 100% dependent on the mother. But instead of asking um, a, an analogy or asking a pivot question, we simply ask the question, why? Why are they dependent on the mother? Why are they not able to survive outside of the mother's womb? might sound like a, a bit of an odd question, but at the end of the day, it's because of how old they are. It's because they have not lived long enough to have developed the physical attributes to be able to live outside of the mother's womb. Therefore, we are saying it is okay to kill those who are not sufficiently old enough because of an attribute tied directly to their age. This is age-based discrimination. And we simply ask, how is age-based discrimination, how is saying it's okay to kill somebody because of how old they are, any better, any more proper, any more appropriate than any other form of discrimination that we have fought against throughout history? That's a more streamlined approach because it cuts the chase so directly and demonstrates, yes, they are human. Yes, they are undeveloped. None of that matters because they are still human and age-based discrimination is not appropriate. So th those are the two ways that I would go about it, Peter. I hope that makes sense to you, the, the listener as well. Um, if you have questions on that, please don't hesitate to, to shoot them in and, and I'll try to clarify. Love it, sir. Thank you for that. Um, yeah, we use common ground analogy question here a lot as well, but are certainly, uh, when I say here on our side of the country, um, I'm doing activism here in Canada, but we certainly are using the concept of human plus X a lot more to, to see who gets human rights um, should be based on our humanity rather than our humanity plus um, a particular stage of life, a particular um, stage of development, or anything like that. With that, we will dive into the second argument here. Now, Cam, this is one that we hear on the streets way less. I don't know if you've heard it at all. I've heard it uh, a few times. Um, someone brought it up. I think it was on a university campus, probably a biology student who was trying to stump me. And uh, I, I, I failed to remember whether they did or not. So I, I wish I could report on that. But um, the argument is this. If one embryo can divide into two identical twins, doesn't that mean that life must begin at some point after that stage, um, after when that is possible? Now, this is called monozygotic twinning, when a single zygote divides into two zygotes, and this happens generally between three to six days. I did read that in very rare cases, it can happen up to 12 days as well. Um, and so there's this bit of a spectrum, but very early on in pregnancy, this zygote can split um, and twin. And uh, so yeah, they have this capacity to become two or perhaps even more human zygotes. Um, and the argument is that this is evidence that human life can't begin at conception or the twin is going to be perhaps in some odd or strange way. Um, you know, two, two, two humans, but the same human, um, or anything like that. Um, so here's where, you know, there's some thoughts that, uh, that I had cam and I know you did as well. Um, abort 73, a very helpful resource helped us out here. Help me out here. Cam's the, Cam's the biologist. He's just uh, unbelievably knowledgeable when it comes to all things, human biology. Um, but I think one of the important things to note, um, especially for our conversation, so for very practical purposes here, is that when it comes to abortion, surgical and med medical abortions are both performed well after the zygotic stage of pregnancy has ended. And, and so those arguing that human zygotes should not be recognized as persons or as humans or whatever it might be, certainly not as an entity deserving of human rights, they must be aware that this argument does nothing to justify abortion in the mainstream now, obviously, um, there are still abortifacients. We can still talk about uh, other arenas um, that cause abortion, which would be birth control and, um, and sort, of, um, sort of the ethical questions surrounding embryonic stem cell research, research uh, in vitro fertilization, all of these which interact with the human being at the zygotic stage of life. So, but the key point here is that... Um, Abortions, surgical and medical abortions are happening well after this psychotic stage has ended. Um, this stage will have ended well past when everyone will be aware that they are pregnant. And so, um, but still a, a useful conversation to have, useful to know uh, how we would respond 
um, as we seek to be the best pro-life activists that we can. And then secondly, Cam, before I, I'll let you jump in and get into more of the scientific jargon, there is overwhelming biological, there's an overwhelming biological consensus that individual human lives begin at fertilization. We've talked about this on episode two, um, where uh, there was a study done um, where, I can't remember the exact number, but a lot of biologists were, were asked when human life begins. And the consensus of over 95% of them was that uh, human life begins at fertilization. Even pro-choice biologists said that uh, human life does, in fact, begin at fertilization. So the, the biological consensus on this, the consensus within the scientific community is set. It's set unlike so many other things uh, that we can talk about, uh, you know, that you read about on the news or whatever else it might be. Um, and so this is the definitive starting point in human development. Um, with the, the possible exception here of the splitting that occurs. So that second zygote that is formed several days later. But Cam, do you have any other thoughts before we dive into how we could respond to something like this? Yeah, I I think that it's an interesting question. It actually came up, um, quick shout out to all the, the fine folks that are part of my stuck um, book study right now. I've got six wonderful people who are doing this book study with me. Um, stay tuned for the next round of book studies that I'll be leading sometime in the new year. Um, this question does, does come up and I feel like it's coming up more and more often, Peter, in my radar because of social media, because people can simply share uh, a statement by by some kind of wingnut um, biologist who's trying to make a case allowing whether it's the morning after pill or or birth control pill as you mentioned um trying to throw kind of haze into this conversation i feel like it's happening more and more that you don't actually have to be able to even articulate this position on a street corner to make it public, you simply have to share a post that your great aunt shared or somebody else shared online kind of thing. And so I think it is worth being aware of. And I think that you hit the, the nail on the head that um, there is an overwhelming universal consensus among biologists and embryologists that this is when human life begins at fertilization, especially in the traditional or natural way. But let's dive into what happens outside of the traditional natural way. And I will give the caveat that I not only here and now, but I want to encourage you to approach this from a biological perspective. I think that there's a fascinating philosophical and theological question as to which twin existed first and what, I mean, did the second soul come into existence at the point of twinning or was it somehow held in some kind of limbo situation? I'm not going to dive into whose soul was there first and at what stage um, the second soul came into existence. Twinning is something that happens not only within the human species, but within a ton of different species. Um, and this is something that I often am tempted to dive into, as Peter, you alluded to my, my biological background, talking about totipotent stem cells and pluripotent stem cells and all that kind of jargon. What you need to know, though, when it comes to having conversations about this is exactly what we talked about beforehand. Twofold way of approaching it. One, the classical common ground analogy question approach to the human plus X age-based discrimination approach. And so how do we go about the two of them? First way, common ground analogy question. This is a little bit more convoluted because it's really difficult to come up with analogies um, that pertain on this issue. And so let, let's dive into a couple of examples that you can maybe not know intuitively, but, but whether you memorize them or whether you just have them in your back pocket, whatever it is, common ground, I agree with you that twinning can happen. Twins exist. This is easy common ground, I hope, for everyone to make. If you don't believe that twins exist, um, we've got a much longer conversation on our hands. Twins exist. Um, twins are great. Whatever. We're not going to get into much more about that. That's common ground. The analogy that you want to build. What I would do is the simplest kind of analogy that is difficult to come up with intuitively. Um, it's not about humans. It's not trotting on a toddler. It's simply talking about another example. And there's a really gross example that you can use using flatworms. Flatworms are a really weird kind of organism where if you cut a, a flatworm um, down lengthwise, um, straight down the middle of a flatworm, and don't do anything else to them, they will regrow the opposite portion of their bodies and they will become two flatworms. 
they are two flatworms as soon as you cut through them. And so could you argue that there was no flatworm initially because you ended up with two after the fact? No. A little less gross. Um, probably don't talk about flatworms because that's just going to turn people off um, even more than they're turned off already by talking about abortion. Um, talk about starfish because everyone loves a good starfish. Starfish are super cool. Um, and for a, a decent number of starfish species, if you were to break off one of their legs, so long as they have a portion of the inner... Um, inner aqueous circle, I think it's called, if you pull off one of their legs, that leg will develop the remainder of the body and you will now have two full starfish. Would you say that there are no starfish in existence right now because you could theoretically pull them all apart and generate a whole bunch more starfish? No, the fact that you have two starfish afterwards does not mean that you didn't have one beforehand. And so if that's the case for starfish, how is that not the case for preborn children? That's the way that it could go. If you want to get into human cloning, that's a much longer conversation. I do really hope that one of these weeks we'll be able to get on a an even more expert biologist than me, because realistically, I have a bachelor's degree and a deep passion, but nothing beyond that. If we can get somebody like Dr. Maureen Kondik or somebody like that on the show to talk in depth about twinning, I'm sure for some people it'll be sleep time music to just drown out um, the worries of your life uh, because it'll be super boring for some of you. For some of you, I hope it'll be really interesting. Um, that's the one way to do it. That's the classical approach, common ground analogy question. The other approach that we already talked about, the human plus X age-based discrimination approach is um, like what we talked about before. Yes, I agree with you that twinning can happen and that you could have two humans after twinning when you only have one before. Why is that? Why is that possible? It's because of how old that organism is. The fact that they retain totipotency in their nature at that point, and they could be broken into two separate embryos, um, is a, a function of their biological age. The reason they can do that is because of how old they are. If they're older, they can no longer do that. If you rip Peter, you or I in half, we're dead. We don't become two humans. Um, we cease to have that ability because of our age. This is age-based discrimination to say that you don't get human rights if you either can or can't do a particular function. Um, and you're back to the conversation from before. How is age-based discrimination any more appropriate than any other forms of discrimination? So hopefully that makes sense as well. Um, yeah, very similar in how to address the two scenarios. And yet, um, very important to have some of that background knowledge as well. Perfect. Thank you so much for that, sir. And with that, we head to the third justification. I'll never forget, Cam, a conversation that I had and a relationship that I had with a young woman in a city close to me. She was pregnant when we first met her, planning to have an abortion. One of our colleagues had a, a long conversation with her. She's decided against her abortion. Um, we went to a number of ultrasounds. I was privileged to be with uh, to be there at one of them um, just to because uh, I became friends with her boyfriend as well. And he was there. So so I went as well. Um, she gave birth to her child. Um, but the sort of wrench in this story, per se, is that she was addicted to various drugs. Um, she smoked, she drank, she was addicted to some drugs. And so when the child was born, um, that little girl spent uh, several months in the NICU, the neonatal intensive, intensive care unit, um, to sort of wean her off of the addiction that she was born with. Now, when we think about some of the messaging that the pro-abortion movement puts out, this this friend, she became a friend. We we met with her many times, hung out with her, and and did a lot with her. Um, this friend was the perfect candidate to get an abortion. And this little girl that was born, uh, who had to be in the NICU for several months, was the perfect candidate to be aborted because of the situation she was in. And that's where we get to the argument we've heard it many times, and that is this: Cam, what if the mother is addicted to drugs or alcohol or sub whatever substance it might be? that will most likely permanently affect the health of the child. And if not permanently, certainly sort of um, affect their, you know, their, their first days uh, outside of the womb uh, as they need to spend some time in the hospital and all of that. And, and sort of to, to frame this in another way, um, a question is, do you think that uh, a Coke addict should be forced to have a baby that will grow up being addicted to crack 
and uh, and thereby living on the streets as well. Now, this is a loaded question, uh, and these are challenging questions, Cam. I know there's a lot of common ground we can find here in the sense of, you know, we don't want any women to be in situations like this, and we can agree and we can understand that situations like this must be extremely difficult and, and certainly difficult when you're pregnant and trying to, to think about a, a way forward. Um, and even that sort of the reframing that I did there, should the Coke addict be forced to have a baby? We're talking about poverty there as well. Uh, along those same lines, there might be disability concerns with the child. But the implication is the same, uh, regardless of how that, ar that argument is phrased. The implication is this, the baby is better off dead than alive and with a drug problem. Now, this is huge. Um, this is challenging. There's, there's lots of common ground here. We as pro-lifers recognize, Cam, um, and I, you're probably nodding there uh, on your screen, um, that we don't want any child to be addicted uh, when they're first born. We don't want them to struggle with some of these things. We want them to thrive, to be in an environment uh, where they uh, can thrive, they can learn about the world and, and everything in it. And, uh, and grow up to be a functioning adult um, and, and do whatever they want to do. But um, the challenge here is, is these children, many children are in fact growing up uh, with, with some of these challenges, be it external challenges where you have a, a parent or multiple parents who are addicted or just you know, having the effects in your own system as well. And so how can we respond to this, sir, when we are hearing uh, arguments like this on the streets or from our colleagues or, or others around us? Yeah, so the process, Peter, is going to be very similar to what we've talked about before. And I think that even before we dive into that, I, you make a great point about not only the false dichotomy that the person that you're speaking with is talking about, but often it's a, a misunderstanding, whether intentional or not, about what abortion is. And, and that might seem odd, but the false dichotomy that stems from this misunderstanding of abortion is, would you a rather a child live with suffering or not live with suffering? That's what they're proposing, and yet their solution for not living with suffering is somehow thinking that abortion is going to prevent their existence and not snuff out their existence. They're thinking about abortion not as something which is going to prevent that suffering from happening, but rather something that is going to end that suffering within a very precious human being who is suffering. I think that's the first thing that we need to clarify, even before we dive into this common ground analogy question progression that we always use, we want to clarify that with them, that what you're suggesting is that we should kill innocent humans to solve a situation involving a tremendous amount of suffering. We're not talking about preventing it from coming into the first place. We're not talking about people who are addicted to drugs, alcohol, whatever other sorts of um, harmful things should not have children in the first place. What you're saying is that those people who have children should kill their children. That clarification, just to make sure that we're talking about the right thing, I think is essential in these conversations. And once you've anchored the conversation on that, I think that you can go into these progression of common ground analogy question. As you mentioned, Peter, empathizing with the fact that we don't want children living um, with any form of suffering, particularly that kind of profound suffering that can be drawn, not only from weaning them off of addiction to hard drugs, but also I know people who are living with um, fetal alcohol syndrome, FAS. I know people, um, I mean, my wife is a teacher. I know lots of people who are teachers and who come in contact with children who have FAS and the challenges that that can bring to them. We can very very much empathize with the suffering that these children will endure throughout basically their entire life, if not their entire life. That's a very real situation. We want to empathize with that, find that common ground. The analogy, hopefully, especially at the end of this episode, having done two of these already, will be somewhat intuitive to you, the listener. Imagine that a born child went through a similar circumstance, somebody living um, in a drug infested home, as it were, or very problematic, we're not even talking about the um, very real, but less intense kind of secondhand smoke sort of thing. Um, there are harrowing stories of children whose parents are addicted to drugs who consume party drugs by accident, or as small children, because they want to be like mom or be like dad who become addicted to hard drugs. Would we ever suggest we should kill those children because their addiction is going to prove to be incredibly difficult for the rest of their lives, maybe recurring addiction, recurring um, 
near death experiences or whatever it may be. No. And if we're not willing to kill born children because of addiction habits, which may have cultivated after they're born, why the same child a few months or a few years earlier who was addicted in similar circumstances? Brings us back to the humanity of the preborn, which is for those who may be tuning in for the first time here, the core of the conversation that we want to have. The reason we keep bringing it back to the humanity of the preborn is because we want to demonstrate the notion and, and very simple principle that this isn't about suffering. This isn't about hardship, because if it were, we'd be willing to kill born children for the same reason. The fact that we're not willing to kill born children for the same reason says and shows us that this isn't about hardship or challenges. It's about viewing preborn children differently from born children. And that gets us into our conversation about the humanity of the preborn. And as Peter, you've mentioned a few times, we cover that in episode two. Please persevere through the cringy um, expressions and delivery that Peter and I had for that. We were still learning the ropes of podcasting. Um, but you can check that out. You can see the other content that we have, especially on our YouTube channel, actually. We've got a few kind of standalone um, kind of videos that talk about the humanity of the preborn, why this is essential. And so that's where we want to go with this circumstance. This is where we want to go with many circumstances, especially when they pivot around hardship and suffering. The two that we talked about earlier were more dependent on their age. They weren't necessarily circumstance-based arguments. And so you can... You can always use common ground analogy question regardless of whether it's a circumstance or whether it's a um, biological factor. If it's a biological factor, you may be able to cut to the chase a little bit more efficiently with that human plus X argument. Wonderful. Sir, uh, sir, that is that is great. Thank you so much for that, Cam. Um, and with that, we are going to be wrapping it up. Thank you so much for tuning in once again to our segment of here's what we say to that segment number six, I believe it was. I uh, just want to share one more time. Uh, let me grab the book. Uh, if you're watching, I'm lifting up a book of Stuck, a complete guide to answering tough questions about abortion. And Cam is as well, just to show that he does reference this book as well. Um, do check it out uh, because it is a very wonderful resource, a very helpful resource in becoming equipped to answer tough questions about abortion, as the title suggests. Um, and, and to do so in an effective and a winsome way. You can find that along with our other merch, uh, including the shirt that Cam is wearing right now with uh, his wonderful face on it. And uh, these items back here, these, these uh, drinkware items, you can find them all on prolifeguys.com slash shop. Become a part of the change rep, the Pro Life Guys merch, um, but the profits as well, just so you're aware, will be going to furthering the uh, outreach of the podcast, trying to reach more and more people with the podcast, and it'll go to pro-life outreach with the organization we work for at the Canadian Center for Bioethical Reform. So um, not only will uh, you buying merch be wonderful stocking stuffers or Christmas gifts or whatever it might be, but you'll also be helping us out in reaching more and more people with good apologetics on one side and with good the truth about abortion on the other. So Thank you so much for that. You can reach out to us and ask us any questions that you might have on our website, ProLifeGuys.com. There's a contact form there, or you can do so by messaging us on Facebook, the ProLife Guys Podcast, um, on Instagram, at ProLife Guys Podcast, on Twitter, at ProLife Guys, and anywhere else as well. We're on YouTube. We're on your favorite podcast catcher. Thank you so much for liking, for subscribing, for hitting that notification bell. And for most importantly, sharing this content with your friends and family, and perhaps even more importantly, is having those conversations about abortion, uh, not just getting this message out there so that people know it on the interwebs, but but going into the public square, the physical one, the online public squares, and having the conversations about abortion to be a defender of the defenseless, a voice for those who have none. Thank you so much for using your voice and for tuning in, and we hope you tune in again next time. God bless each and every one of you. Oh,